This is perhaps the holiest day in the Christian calendar. And for 3,500 years, we have celebrated Easter and Passover. They're really the same holy day. We looked at the Passover celebration some last week. And this week, I just want us to sit back and to imagine, to listen to the story of Easter morning and listen to what the scripture says, but also what it implies if you put yourself in the ears and eyes of those that experience the day. I will be looking down a lot more than normal because I'll be reading a lot of this. It is in manuscript form because it is my uh, bringing together of all four gospel accounts plus some reflections in the rest of the New Testament and some bits of history into one story. I love stories. Stories are the second most powerful thing in the universe. The stories we hear, the stories we choose to believe, those change everything. Just hours after breaking bread with his disciples and calling them to the remembrance we shared last week and this week and every week, Jesus was betrayed by one of his own. He was tried and punished for crimes he did not commit, and he was hung on a cross and left to die. And the events of those fr that Friday have been stamped on our hearts and changed everything about our world and our culture. As important as that Friday was, however, had history ended or that story ended on the Friday, we would inhabit a universe with no savior, no grace, no hope, no power to be, as Ray brought up during communion. Paul said, in fact, as Ray could continue to read through there, that if Christ was not raised from the dead, then the Christians are the most pitiable of all people. Because we have formed our lives around the resurrection. But the world did not end on that Friday night. Sunday morning came. There's a big Saturday in between we don't talk about very often. From the crushing disappointment and horror of Friday night, there was a silence of heaven for a long time. And people packed their bags to go to Emmaus. They hid in locked rooms. They tried to escape a riotous Jerusalem. But Sunday morning came, and we are here to celebrate the rest of that story. The Sunday morning that forever left the mark of history upon our hearts, upon the hearts of men, and upon the history of the world. For it truly was a hinge point of history. Everything turns on there. The four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, left us their records of this amazing events of that Sunday. And each contributed a slightly different view of the same series of events giving us a rich and beautiful history, a story of the most amazing days at all, of all time. And today, let's tell that story. You ready? Let's begin. Those who loved Jesus so well had taken pains to make sure that Jesus was off the cross before the Sabbath day began that Friday at dusk. Jesus had been in the tomb now since Friday evening, but Sunday, Saturday evening was to them Sunday. So in the dark hours between light on Saturday and dawn on Sunday, three of the women decided to go back to the tomb to finish taking care of the body of Christ, to show it honor. They knew where to go. Uh, they had all been there just a day and a half of before Joseph of Arimathea, a rich and important fellow, had helped lay out the body. They wanted to wrap his corpse with additional spices beyond those which Nicodemus and Joseph had already used on Friday. The three women now approach in the dark the tomb. They are Mary Magdalene. Mary, probably the wife of James, perhaps the mother of James. The scripture's unclear and a woman named Salome. They had purchased the spices with their own money, and they were carrying a heavy load of them. As they approached the tomb, the glimmer of dawn begins to form in the eastern sky, and it was probably on the way to the tomb that they experienced something which was um, even more frightening in this period of terror. The ground shook. Something happened. We know 
that while they were approaching the tomb and before they got in sight, an angel of the Lord rolled away the great circular stone that sealed the entrance of the tomb. And when Jesus appeared out of that grave, free from grave clothes, free from the tomb, free from the clutches of Satan, free from death, that he shone as bright as the sun. The guards were overwhelmed by the action of the angels and the glory of Christ, and they fainted away like dead men. Death was defeated. Jesus was back, as was read to you. The death which he had to accomplish, he had to die. We often don't talk about that. We, we focus on the forgiveness of sins, and I certainly understand that because I've got a lot of sins that I'm glad he has forgiven and that he will forgive as I continue to make mistakes in future. But the main point of this cross was hope for everybody. Death defeated. Christus rex. Christ the king, the death of death. Now the unconscious soldiers knew that. Jesus knew that, but nobody else did. Sometime as the ladies are still approaching, the, the soldiers regain consciousness and realize that they're in trouble. This is a death penalty offense to break the seal of a tomb, to, uh, to lose something you're supposed to be guarding. And they've run to go find allies to help them make up a story. The women had been worried about whether they could gain access to the tomb because those guards were serious soldiers. And they were just women. Just women, you see. And they were followers of a crucified criminal. They had no power, no standing. In fact, they might be mistreated, assaulted, beaten, harassed as followers of a criminal who had just been killed by the state. When they got to the tomb, they had to be confused because... The way was clear. The, the soldiers were gone. The tomb was open. Now imagine the fear and the trepidation of these women still in early dawn light walking up to a broken seal, stone rolled back. This is all wrong. Where are the guards? This is a death penalty offense. Will this be blamed upon us? There are no witnesses to show that we didn't do this. Concerned about the fate of the body of Jesus, they steeled themselves, and the, like the brave women they were, they entered the tomb, only to find it wasn't empty after all. There was an angel there, looked like a young man dressed in white, but they knew who and what he was. And then right behind them, another angel appeared. They did not know as they approached the tomb in fear that there were angels guarding them front and back. The angel said, don't be afraid. It's interesting how angels lead with that line most of the time. Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Well, never mind what the angel said. The women were terrified, both at the presence of angels and at the absence of the body. The angel in front of them tried to help them understand that something had happened which had never happened before. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? I always find that fascinating. Angels are here to serve and to protect and do a lot of things, but they don't understand us. That's why Christ had, to, had taken human form. God understands us. The angels are going, it's no big deal. What are you doing looking here for him? He's not here, for he is risen just as he said he would. Look at the place where they laid him. Remember how he told you when he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man had to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, crucified, and rise again on the third day? Just like that, they did remember. It didn't all make sense to them, but they remembered. Then the angel added, go quickly. Tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. He goes before you into Galilee. You'll see him there. And fascinating, he adds, you have my word. Sometime in the first centuries of church, an anonymous scribe writing this passage was so overwhelmed, he wrote a word in the margin, behold. In many versions of the Bible, that word migrated from the margin into the text. Doesn't bother me at all. Behold, meaning how wonderful. Just think of this. The one you thought was dead 
you'll see him again, and you've got the angel's word on it. The women took off at a dead run. They wanted to get back to the house where the believers were gathered in mourning, probably at the house of John Mark, and tell them that they didn't need to mourn anymore, but they're not really sure why or how. We can show that here in a little bit. They, they got the news, but the news had not settled in yet. That happens to people. They didn't speak to anyone on the way back, which was very understandable because you need to remember that the city was still at unrest. Roman soldiers were roaming the streets. Some of the Jews, a minority of the Jews that had yelled crucify him, the mob was still in the street while the others, the majority of people were huddled in their homes. And remember that streets and homes were not like they are now. They're little alleyways. Homes were often connected, and when there was a separation, it was only a foot or so between this window and door and the next one. People heard and saw everything. They knew if they are caught, they're in trouble. They have no rights, you see. There was no constitution, no bill of rights, no police force. Rome had no regard for the life of an individual. They would kill anyone to keep the peace, innocent or not. So they run. Jerusalem was a dangerous place to be, but also a confusing one. Only one of the gospel writers says, as an aside, that some other saints were resurrected on that day, and they were in the city. And that's all we know about this. I'd like to know more, please. But this is it. There's an odd confluence of panic and hope going on. Mary Magdalene sought out Peter and John first. And told them the news. Now, by the way, the way she told it showed it hadn't sunk in yet. She said, they've taken the Lord away and we don't know where they've laid him. Please don't judge this woman. We've had over 2,000 years to get used to this story. And many of people still discard it. But for them, this was all new and very unthinkable for all kinds of reasons. You didn't pick up bodies and walk with them. That made you unclean. I mean, there were, there were so many things going on that broke the rules of the universe. Peter and John took off, running to find what was going on. There'd been too much inaction. It was time for action. John was younger, so he arrived first. But also, he was a little wiser. He stopped at the entrance of the tomb. Peter, a little slower, being older, just barreled right past John and into the tomb because Peter was Peter. By the way, you might be John, you might be Peter, you might be Paul, you might be Deborah, you might be Mary, 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 or the other Mary. You might be any of these. <laughs> but as Paul said, as he was ending his life, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. Be who God made you to be. Don't compare yourself to others. Don't wish you were somebody else. That's intellectual suicide. God wanted you. That's why he made you. So it's fun to watch the personalities at play. From the entrance, John had seen the shroud of Christ lying on the floor, but that was basically all. But there was something strange about the shroud. I know a lot of people pass around on social media. I got it from several that there's a real significance to the folding of the napkin. And really, no, that was made up less than a generation ago. But something was very interesting the shroud complete with its hundred pounds of spices that they would compact around the body with the wrappings was still intact. It was merely folded and laid aside. Nobody cut him out of there. Nobody unwrapped him. He just left it. Well, John needed nothing else to convince him. He could see that a body had to pass through that. And that could only mean a miracle. And that could only mean that what Jesus told them was going to happen actually happened. Now, that might seem to you to be a dumb moment or a why, why not? But we often pray to God with doubt in our hearts. We often walk around with doubt in our hearts. To see what Jesus said would happen actually happened is often a surprise to all of us. It certainly was to them. So, John and Peter hurry back to tell the others what they'd seen, but in their rush, they had missed something. They'd failed to notice that they had been followed. A weeping woman, Mary Magdalene, 
She moved more slowly than they did. Women were in more danger at that time than men were. She now approached the tomb as they charged off back into the city. She was left alone, ignored, confused, and perhaps in some danger. She couldn't make herself go back into the tomb at first, but she stopped outside. And she wept fully, deeply, freely. Her heart had been broken at the loss of Christ and now at the loss of his body. When she finally looked into the tomb again, she was amazed to see it full of light. The two angels were back. Isn't that interesting? They didn't show up to protect the men. A little side fact that I told my wife as we were coming in, and I didn't realize that maybe other people hadn't noticed it, but if you're a legalist or a patternist that believe we have to follow everything exactly as Scripture says about worship and everything else, and you pick the pattern, you might have missed this. If we were to have a sunrise service and to do it the way it was done in Scripture, only women could be there. Because those were the only ones he talked to that, one, that morning. The only ones he walked with. The only ones he gave good news with. And they were also the first evangelist of the risen Lord. They were the first one to get the charge. Go tell the story. Just like the Samaritan woman was the first foreign missionary. When she went to her town to tell everybody what he had done. Let's remember to look at Jesus. And get our cues from Jesus. Regardless. Two angels are back. Sitting on either side. Where the body of Christ had been laid. They showed concern for her. Something which the men had lacked. Hadn't done at least. They say why are you crying? Once again angels serve us. But they don't get us. She repeated her fears. Somebody has stolen the body of our Lord. I, I cannot find it. The angels did not respond this time, and that is very important. Their eyes would have left her. Why didn't they respond? Because you do not speak in the presence of your commander. Jesus is right behind her. They go quiet. Their eyes move. Mary follows her eyes and turns to see what was going on behind her with her tear-filled eyes. And perhaps due to the insults and injuries, the damage his body had taken, she did not recognize him at first. He spoke quietly and said, Dear lady, why are you crying? Listen to this next question. What are you looking for? Remember, she'd been told he was risen, just as he said. She was still looking for a dead body. So he asked her, what are you looking for? She thought he might be the, the tomb area caretaker. And she said, sir, where did you take him? Tell me and I will carry him off. With that phrase alone, I love Mary Magdalene with all my heart. What faith she had. That was a very risky thing to do and very difficult to manage. How's this woman going to drag a body through this town, in this state. She wanted him even if nobody else wanted him. I'd like to be like her one day. Jesus was deeply touched by her, her love, her loyalty, her tears, and he spoke in the language of their childhood, calling her by her childhood name, Miriam. It was only then that she realized who he was. She'd been looking for a dead body, and she got a live savior. She cried out, Master, and she fell at his feet, and she grabbed him really tightly. And Jesus did a little bit of wordplay, which is the way the Hebrew works and the Jews work. When he basically, he's, in some of your versions, it'll say, you know, let me go, for I've not yet ascended to my father. It really means, don't crush me. I'm not dead yet. I haven't gone back to God. Well, regardless... He did allow the apostles to touch him later, which might indicate sometime during that day he did go back to God because he was on the move. Regardless, he told her, go back to Jerusalem and get them ready for my return. Notice a change in plans. Did you catch that? Before, 
the angels had told them, and Jesus before his death had told them, go into Galilee and I'll meet you there. But the men were hiding in a locked up room. And then, so he says, go to Jerusalem. Prepare them. I'm coming. So she goes. Jesus, very kind. He makes sure the women are with the men rather than separated. He gets them together. When Mary Magdalene left, Jesus stayed long enough to see Mary, the mother of James, and Salome return. Presumably, they'd gone to find Mary Magdalene. Jesus intercepts them and says, peace. Literally, hi. In Hebrew today, to this very day, to say hello is shalom, which means peace. To say goodbye is shalom, means peace. The most often given command from the lips of Jesus was fear not. And the most often said word by angels recorded in scripture is peace. Preachers who make you frightened, churches that make you doubt your salvation and the love of God are not speaking the language of Jesus and angels. If you speak of peace, if you speak of love, if you say, don't be afraid, you are speaking Jesus' words. But let's go back. He says, go tell all my people that they're to go to Galilee. In other words, go back to Jerusalem and get them, but I want them to still go to Galilee. They won't, by the way. Spoiler alert. Those men are in a room locked, and that's where they want to stay. Well, the women left and somewhere this afternoon on a Sunday Jesus took a little personal side trip to talk to somebody it's only recorded in one verse in scripture none of the other gospels record it Luke 24 34 Jesus had a private reunion with Peter Peter the one who denied him three times in Jesus's hearing it was in the place where Jesus was being tried mocked He heard Peter. Have you ever feared what it's going to be like to face God with all you've done? Here's the thing. We don't know what was said. But we do know what happened. Because the next time you see Peter, he stands up on the day, not the next time, but he's a brave man. And soon he stands up on the day of Pentecost and preaches in public He's not afraid anymore to declare, I belong to Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God. He was forgiven. He was accepted. He was given shalom. Well, sometime later, on the road again, he finds people leaving. Two people, Cleopas is one, and almost certainly the other one is Luke. He says, where are you going? He says, haven't you heard Everything's fallen apart. It's all over. The death of dreams. It's, it's over for us. We, we, we have to get out of Jerusalem. We're going to Emmaus. And Jesus began to... They didn't recognize him. He began to talk to them about all that the scriptures had to say concerning him. And by the time they were done, the men had turned around. Jesus was gone suddenly. So they burst into the room thinking their news is going to be shocking to the disciples. But... The people there had already heard from Peter about their Lord. I don't think they really understood who he was until then. Not just the rising from the dead. Isn't that fascinating? We can use the word just in that sentence. Not just the rising from the dead, but the love he brought back with him. Even when the world had been to us quite the disappointment, not to him. In that locked room where Cleopas, Luke, and others spread the good news that Christ was alive, Jesus suddenly appeared, and those who had not seen him yet were surprised, and, and why not? He'd been a dead man in their mind, only moments before. And the words, the same words he gave to the women by the graveside, the same word he gave which announced his birth in Bethlehem over 30 years before, peace. To help them understand that he was not a ghost. He was not a vision. He let them handle him closely. It was him. Bearing the horrid scars of the beating and crucifixion. But it was him. He sat 
and he ate with them. We never get the power of that. In the first century, you are who you eat with. Spirits, risen Lord, he doesn't need food, but he eats with them to show them, you're okay. You're all right. As God would tell Paul, I have enough grace for you. My grace is sufficient. As he ate, he reminded them of the scriptures, how they'd prophesied all of this. A lot of light bulbs, I'm sure, going off around their head. They were not to view the cross as a shameful thing, but as a symbol, rather, of the greatest triumph of all. He was alive, and he had come to bring them life and show them death is now defeated, and there is no more to fear. Many of us are stuck. We're stuck on Friday night. Or we're stuck on a long Saturday. At times, all of us have experienced the depth of pain and despair that Jesus' friends felt. Sometimes it's because our dreams have died. Sometimes it's because we're ashamed of ourselves and our own iniquity. Sometimes it's because we feel so completely, utterly helpless, outmaneuvered, outnumbered, overpowered. We stumble around looking for something. We hide behind our own locked doors. We take refuge in memories, but they're not shared in joy because we're certain that our greatest, best days are now gone. We expect very, very little. We look for a corpse to care for. And then Sunday morning comes, and if it has not come for you, it will come because it came. I know it sounds strange, but because of Jesus, your Sunday morning will come. And here's the thing with Jesus. It won't just come once. It will continue to come. And as much as you may be in despair right now, you may not know this, but you have angels ahead of you and angels behind you. And they may not get you, but Jesus does, and they follow what he says. Just as we despair that Jesus was lost to us, there he is, like Mary Magdalene, standing right behind us, calling our name. We're shocked that he'll speak to us. I mean, how will he treat us after we failed him, when we feel stupid and slow? He says, peace. We run and hide. We speak a little, teach a little, aware that there are dangerous forces out there, but forgetting Jesus has sent his angels to cover us and help us and get us back to him. He went into the depths of that most feared place, death. And he took upon himself all the sins that have ever been committed, which could ever be committed. And he came out of the grave battered and torn, but alive and triumphant. The angels he would not call on Friday to save himself, he called on Sunday for us. Think of that. He comforted the women, sought out Peter, sat down with his people and ate all for us. He did that with you today if you took communion with us. Jesus was taking it too with you. I've had people say, no, he'll only take it in heaven. He said he'd take it in his kingdom of heaven. We're in it. You're in it now. Heaven doesn't wait. We are agents of heaven on this earth. We are already in the kingdom. Read Hebrews chapter 12. We're already on the mountain. But... Here's the point. His, his consistent and persistent message to you is peace and fear not. That's a constant refrain of the angels. And all who saw him were transformed. Peter on Pentecost was not the same Peter we had seen before. And this was no one-time thing. When Saul of Tarsus met Jesus, he was no longer Saul. He was Paul. These people went from hiding behind locked doors to being warriors of light out in the open, declaring that Jesus was the Son of God, the way, the truth, the life. And history is very plain in this, that they did not recant even under torture and death, even under the death of their loved ones. The apostles never wavered. You don't die for a lie. You die for a truth that is greater than your killers can see. We encounter that same Jesus today in baptism, in worship, in thought, in contemplation. And if for some reason he seems distant to you, lost to you, 
Remember how Mary Magdalene felt in the tomb. She felt Christ was lost to her too. She was willing to settle for something far below a risen Christ. Just a body to care for. But he was there. And if you want to find him, look for him. Look around you. I was up at 5.14 this morning. Stepped out on the back porch around 5.40. First glimmer of light touching horizon. Birds were going nuts. The birds were having a party. My thought was, open your eyes. The birds have already heard. And the appropriate response has been given. God keeps his promises. Easter proves it. 